Amen. Thank you very much. What a great conference. I know that is so cliche, uh, but I really do believe that every single conference is the best ever. And certainly the preaching this uh, week, uh, Monday night, yesterday, this morning, uh, if you're not repentant and in the process of being radically changed, you probably need to get saved. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. It's such a uh, privilege, and I don't take that lightly. My uh, fear is, or my prayer is, that I hope I can contribute something uh, up to the caliber of what's already been ministered thus far. And I want to read from 2 Peter in just a moment. I read uh, a story about a family... Uh, this family had two boys aged 10 and 12, and they were the absolute worst boys' behavior. They were kicked out of school. They were in the principal's office. They vandalized. They lied. They were incorrigible. And the parents were exacerbated. They couldn't get control of these boys. They were running around. And as one of the pastors said, setting the agenda for the family. So finally, a friend of the mother said, listen, we go to a church and the preacher there is really good at working with these kids like your sons. Why don't you call him? And she gave him the number and the pastor agreed uh, for the parents to drop the younger one over uh, uh, and then uh, pick him up uh, and then drop the other one off and the pastor would talk to them and he did have a way of uh, being able to introduce uh, uh, Christ into these young uh, lives and so uh, the first little boy, the 10 year old is dropped off and he's uh, very uncomfortable sitting there in this pastor's uh, living room and the pastor is there and the pastor uh, uh, said to him, son, where is God? The little boy was very puzzled with that. These are unchurched kids. They know about things like that, but uh, very puzzled. And he kind of looked back at the preacher and shrugged his shoulders and, I, I don't know. And then again, the preacher said, son, where is God? I want you to tell me where he is. And the little boy now gets very scared. He doesn't understand this. Uh, and then the preacher became a little louder and a little more forceful. Uh, and he said, son, where is God? I want you to answer me. And with that, this kid couldn't take it anymore. He leapt up to his feet, uh, ran out the door onto the street, uh, sprinted the six blocks to his house, uh, ran in the front door of the house, uh, up the stairs, uh, into his bedroom, uh, and into the closet. He's petrified. And so the brother, knowing that he's supposed to go to this preacher's house next, <laughs> watches this drama and runs up to the bedroom and hears uh, uh, his little brother panting uh, uh, in the closet and he opens the door and says, uh, what, what's wrong? What, what happened uh, over at the preacher's house? Uh, and his little brother said, dude, we are really in trouble this time. God's missing uh, and they think we did it. That's for all of my friends that think I'm humorless. <laughs> and the point is that it's very easy for a sincere effort to bring correction to be misunderstood. Would you, and I'm asking everybody here this question, would you be willing to acknowledge that there is presently an area of your life where you need correction? It may be only a slight one or two or three or four degree course correction, or it may be a major matter in your life where correction needs to be enacted. Correction is one of the most important features of the Christian life. 
the ability to receive correction is going to be one of the greatest uh, character development areas of your life. And I say that uh, because by nature, we do not have the ability to receive correction. That begins from childhood. Nobody likes correction. Nobody wants correction. Uh, we don't welcome it. Uh, we recoil in the face of it. Uh, and given a choice, uh, we would never put, in our, put ourselves in a position uh, to have to be corrected. Uh, it has such an unpleasant connotation. We call or we refer to the prison system as the Department of Corrections. Has a very unpleasant sound to it. Come to the office, you need correction. We don't want that. The fact of the matter is that right now you could be unaware of the fact, but you may very well be in need of life saving, destiny saving, and destiny preserving correction uh, and that's why you are here at this conference uh, God is desperately trying to reach you with a word of correction the text is an extreme case we're going to look at the life of Balaam it's an extreme case but I think that we can all all find ourselves here there are features of correction that are present in this text that apply to me and they apply to all of us. And I want to ask you, in the beginning part of this message, I want to ask you, regardless of who you are, long-term member, disciple, pastor, leader, pastor's wife, whoever you are, I want to ask you to put yourself in a position right now of acknowledging, God, I need correction. Can we make that attitudinal shift right now? And as I said, it could be this conference is going to save your life. It's going to save your ministry. And I have no doubt that in any conference, destinies are being weighed in the balances. And some of it may relate to this. The message is entitled, Don't Be Balaam. From uh, 2 Peter, I want to read. We're going to be referring to numbers where... The narrative of Balaam is, but for brevity's sake, let's just take these few verses uh, and use them as our starting point here this morning. 2 Peter 2, 15. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, uh, but he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey, uh, speaking with a man's voice, uh, restrained the madness of the prophet. And then two other verses in 2 Timothy. You don't need to turn there. You're familiar with it. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, uh, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So I want to talk first of all about the need that we have uh, for correction. Let's talk about what it is from a practical, scriptural, Word of God perspective. First of all, correction is a necessity. It is not an option. You will not survive life. And this is regardless of how well-developed you may be, how righteous, how much integrity, uh, how high you've risen uh, uh, in your Christian experience in ministry. Uh, correction uh, is always going to be a necessity uh, in your life. You will not survive uh, without a good measure uh, of correction along the way. Our text says uh, all Scripture uh, is given by inspiration of God uh, and is profitable uh, 
for correction. That word means to straighten up again, to restore to an upright state. And again, the key words there in that definition are the word again and to restore, implying that this is something you're going to need with regularity. You're going to need constant course adjustments that are not going to come as a result of your own uh, uh, revelation in relationship with God. It is of necessity uh, that you learn to receive correction uh, from others. Another definition uh, is a change that rectifies an error uh, or an inaccuracy, uh, a change that makes something right uh, or to rectify or to amend. And the point is that it is a means of uh, getting you back on track uh, keeping you on track, uh, however slight the course correction uh, may be. Is there not an area of your life right now where you need correction? There's surely, unless we're perfect, unless we're Jesus in the flesh, uh, it would have to be said that it is true that every one of us uh, is in a position tonight, uh, this morning, uh, where we need correction. uh, And this highlights and underscores uh, a very basic premise of life, uh, and that is that you cannot and you will not stay right with God. You will not remain on a right course uh, and maintain a right heart and right attitudes uh, without uh, the correction uh, that comes from God and comes from others. A source outside of yourself. Now, the text gives us a good picture of how this can be applied. Let's consider Balaam and his story in a bit of a nutshell. We know that the children of Israel came and camped in the territory of the Moabites. On their journey to the promised land, King Balak, the king of the Moabites, is terrified of them. He's heard the reports of what they did to Egypt, of what their God did. And so they come, they camp, and they're stretched across the landscape as far as the eye can see from the right to the left and to the horizon. And this group of people has horrified and terrified him. And so he seeks out a man named Balaam that he wants to curse the people of God. And he sends a message and says, please come, curse this people. They're too mighty. I know who you bless is blessed, and I know who you curse is cursed. And so Balak sends messengers to retrieve Balaam. And when they arrive and they state their business, the Bible says that God goes to, uh, that Balaam rather goes uh, and he prays. Balaam does, he prays. In Numbers 22, 12, and God said to Balaam, you shall not go, you shall not curse this people, for they are blessed. And so we know that King Balak's messengers go back to him, give him the report, Balaam's refusing, he sends them back with a greater offer. They come back this second time, and this is what pulls a trigger in the character of Balaam, where he begins to rationalize a disobedient course in his life. Correction is an effort that God will make on your behalf to help you. But ultimately, correction may not be the deciding factor because correction can be refused. And ultimately, the story of Balaam is a story like ours of God's will and self-will. God's way and our way. And you can be saved. We're not talking, I'm not saying or thinking uh, that everyone here is Balaam, uh, but the point is uh, that we can be on a sincere effort uh, to try to find the mind of God, uh, and we can pick a wrong course in that sincerity. God already told Balaam what to do, already gave him his course. Balaam knew what God said, 
about the matter, and then when they come back the second time with a greater offer and a more passionate appeal, he makes this statement, let me go therefore that I may know what more the Lord will say to me. Well, there isn't a more. He already heard from God. God already told him what to do. Now he begins to slide into position where he's going to need some correction. And God dedicates himself to that task. Now the next phase of the story to some is a little confusing. It's evident that God doesn't change his mind with Balaam. But there's something at work in his heart. There's attitude. There's character. There's decisions that are being made. And God has to try to insert himself into the depths of Balaam's heart in order to recover him, deal with him, get him off the wrong course and onto a right course. I want to tell you that course correction is one of the most difficult tasks that God embarks upon in any one of our lives. Trying to get you to change a course that you've invested in that you believe is the right course, that you sincerely think uh, that no harm will come to me. God came to Balaam that second night and said, if the men come to you, go with them. But only the word which I speak to you, that you shall do. So the point here is that Balaam is going to go on this wrong course God is accepting that fact. It's in his heart to do so. The most encouraging thing here is that God doesn't give up. He goes along with Balaam on his wrong course in an effort to to try to gain access to his heart. He doesn't quit, doesn't give up. Oh, you're going to go that way later for you then. He goes along with him. On this wrong course. And again, God is facing the most difficult area of human nature to deal with. Our stubbornness, our self-will, and the belief that our course is right when it is clearly not. And so he goes down this wrong road. God goes down that wrong road with him. And I declare to you that the exact same thing can happen to any one of us here today. Correction is all about intervention. God is a God who intervenes. That means he inserts himself. Certainly when you pray, God, I need you to insert yourself and make provision. Help me overcome my enemies. God is a God who intervenes as a result of answered prayer. But if you're not praying, he'll intervene anyway. Another verse is so powerful in the narrative. Then God's anger was aroused because Balaam went. And the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as an adversary against him. Anger aroused, standing against him, becoming an adversary. It doesn't mean that God is now an enemy and wants to destroy Balaam, but what God is doing here is he's standing against the choices that we have made in life and the direction that we are headed to that God has become an enemy, not to you. He loves you, and he's trying to preserve your destiny and get you back on course and get you back on track. But sometimes he will position himself as an enemy against what you are doing. There are three stages of correction. And this is kind of the fun part of the story, actually, if you think about it. Then the donkey saw the angel of the Lord. The donkey (laughs) saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword. And the donkey turned aside out of the way and went into the field. So Balaam struck the donkey and turned her back 
onto the road. The first of these three stages of correction is that God will frustrate your purpose. The angel of the Lord stands in the way, can't proceed further, and so the donkey turns aside, and sometimes God will step in, and you need to ask yourself, are the frustrations in your life that you're experiencing a result of the angel of the Lord standing in my way? That's a legitimate question. It's not always the cause of our frustration. But it's a good question to ask. God will hinder you along the way purposefully. And of course, Balaam retaliates against the donkey and because this, he's frustrated. He wants to go that way and doesn't see why he shouldn't and why he can't. He tries to get the donkey back on track. And then the second phase of correction the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path with a wall on this side, a wall on that, and the donkey saw the angel of the Lord and pushed herself against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall, so he struck the donkey again. Now, correction gets painful. Don't put it past God to inflict pain sometimes. David understood what this was all about. When he numbered the children of Israel, he sinned, he violated, and the Bible says that God gave him three choices, and the three choices were God, God is saying, I am going to make this hurt. Because apparently God views this as an egregious violation. David should have known better. And so God gave him three choices. Famine, being chased by your enemies, or a plague striking. All of those are very painful. And all of it is a consequence of God trying to get his attention in order to bring correction to his life. And then the third way... Then the angel of the Lord went further, stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn, either to the right hand or to the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. So Balaam's anger was aroused, and he struck the donkey with his staff. Now God is removing options from him. Now he cannot. And it's not by revelation but God is inserting himself to the degree that he can't proceed with his chosen course. Donkey lays down, won't move. Balaam cannot proceed. And of course, Balaam now takes his frustrations out on the instrument of correction that God is using. And I want you to get this. This is a feature of our nature. Balaam wants to kill the donkey. He's mad because his agenda is being called out and is being interfered with by this donkey. And remember, when he had this conversation with his donkey, the donkey served faithfully. I think it's safe to say that the donkey loved his master. There is no ill will going on here. This is not a donkey that is a rebel. This is not a donkey that has crossed any lines. But now God is using a donkey as an instrument to speak into Balaam's life as an effort to help him now that correction is needed. And Balaam strikes the donkey. He makes an enemy out of someone who's trying to help him. Balaam said, this is uh, how Balaam is thinking. The Bible says uh, that Balaam said to the donkey, let's just bypass the whole thing of having a conversation with the donkey and just stick to what it says here. Balaam said to the donkey, you have abused me. I wish I had a sword, for now I would kill you. It's not what the donkey's doing. He's not abusing him. It's a word of correction. And then 
The Bible says that the Lord opened Balaam's eyes. He saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand. And what is so striking about this part of the text is that here's Balaam, a man of God, who prayed and heard the voice of God, interacted with God, but here he is, and he's not seeing the angel of the Lord, but the donkey is. The donkey sees what Balaam doesn't. There are those around you, pastor, who see what you don't. And our instinct sometimes when that is pointed out is to strike at least the voice of correction that is countering the course that we have chosen. And listen what the Bible says that Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned for I did not know you stood in the way against me. So all of this, these three appearances of the angel of the Lord, the donkey saw, Balaam didn't. The donkey's reacting, Balaam is not. It's possible for you not to know, not to see, not to recognize, not to realize. What do you do when someone makes an effort to point out what you're not seeing? In the case of Balaam, he strikes the voice. The voice is doing nothing wrong. The voice is not a rebel. The voice has no ill will. In fact, he has good will towards his master. No line is being crossed. No one has to deputize the donkey so that he can speak to Balaam. He's simply acting in his master's best interest, even though his master is not receiving and doesn't realize that. We have this idea that if it's a donkey, we don't have to listen. It's a donkey. It's just a... <laughs> what could he possibly offer? And some even view this as a violation. Think about Abigail. Abigail is the wife of Nabal who David wants to kill. And so David arms himself, arms his men. They go to kill Nabal and all of his servants. And David said, uh, made a statement to the effect that uh, uh, I'm going to slaughter, not a male will live beyond today. And so Abigail positions herself in his way. Who is she? She's someone that David has never met and doesn't even know. But she positions herself. She's not a rebel. She's not crossing any lines. Nobody has deputized her. But she begins to speak a word of correction. And the most telling part of the story is that David listens. He doesn't strike and retaliate. In fact, he follows the direction that she provided. We have the wise woman of Tekoa, who Joab sent to speak to David after uh, 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 Absalom had been banished, uh, gone for years, David makes no effort to retrieve uh, and restore uh, and redeem him. And so Joab, of all people, sees the wrongness of this, uh, and he sends uh, the wise woman of Tekoa to speak to David uh, about this wrong. Who is she? David doesn't know who she is, uh, but she has been sent uh, to speak a word of correction. And the Bible says, Therefore the woman said, Please let your maid servant speak another word to my lord the king. And that's King David. And, she, and he said, Say on. And so she said, Why have you schemed such a thing? And she begins to stick the blade in. It's an appeal. She loves David. She's loyal to David. She's faithful. But there's something that he's not seeing that somebody needs to point out. I want to talk secondly about the animus that we have for correction. And this is very well documented. There is something in our nature. There's no one here that doesn't have this present in your nature. 
And it's not just that we don't like correction. We don't fancy being corrected. Something far deeper in our nature. Listen to the words that Proverbs uses to describe our animus. Proverbs 3.11, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects. The word despise means to disdain, to loathe, to abhor. It's a very strong word. Balaam despises what the donkey is doing. Uh, and then Proverbs uh, uses similar rhetoric uh, say, uh, uh, and say N- how I have hated instruction uh, and my heart despised correction. Uh, I have not obeyed the voice of my teachers uh, nor inclined my ear to those who instructed me. That word instructed uh, uh, literally means corrected me. Uh, I was on the verge of total ruin uh, in the midst of the congregation. Again, very very harsh and strong, the strongest of words used, hated instruction, despised correction. Proverbs 3, my son, do not despise the chasing of the Lord, nor detest his correction. In Proverbs 10, 17, the Bible says, he who refuses correction goes astray. Proverbs 12, 1, whoever loves instruction loves knowledge, but he who hates correction He's unwise. Listen, it is in all of us to do that. I have felt some of those sentiments more recently than I want to admit to you. And I think that this animus that we have for correction is one of the most dangerous tendencies of our fallen nature. We can misbehave. We can do wrong, we can disobey, we can be unwise, and we will be all of those things. But if you can't receive correction, you literally are doomed in life to the fate that the road you're traveling down will take you eventually. Balaam needed correction. And there are reasons why we need correction. I want to talk very quickly about five of those reasons why we need correction, all of us. And remember, I've asked to attitudinally today put ourselves in a position, God, I know there's an area of my life, maybe I'm not seeing it, maybe I'm like Balaam right now, not evil, not not all jacked up in my spirit and heart, but there's something I'm not seeing, Lord. I recognize the possibility of that. So number one reason that we need correction is that our own rationale cannot always be trusted. I know you're smart. I know you're clever. But our own rationale cannot always be trusted. We don't always see things the way they need to be seen. Our own heart, our own attitudes, our own track record. Listen, we are invested in the course that we're cho- we've chosen. And when you're invested in a course over a long period of time, it's very hard to admit that I need to get off this course I've been on for this very long time. You know, the Scripture is just as much for us as it is for the sinner or the backslider, I think, in light of... Uh, what I'm preaching this morning, Proverbs 14, 12, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end of thereof is the way of death. So again, we have Balaam, who is a man who can hear from God. That's documented. He can obey God. That's in the text. He recognizes the voice of God, has a relationship with God, but even given all those things, our own rationale, cannot always be trusted. Secondly, it is so very easy to get misguided in life. It is so very easy to get misguided in life, and the reasons for that are not all nefarious. Certainly, things like woundings, and when crisis strikes, 
when you're deeply wounded and offended, uh, even your own sincerity uh, can be an instrument to take you down a wrong road. Uh, so the misguiding uh, of life is not always because of pride uh, or because of stubbornness. Those obviously can be features, uh, but we can get so easily misguided in life. You genuinely want to go the right way. But when you want to go the right way, you take a turn. Haven't you ever been driving down the road in an unfamiliar city or maybe your own city? I know exactly how to get where I'm going and it seemed like this was the right turn and that was the right turn, but it wasn't. Now you're lost and you're desperate. You don't have GPS. You left your cell phone at home and now you have to humble yourself just like the sinner or backslider and go ask for directions. Your own sincere effort to navigate your way through life can take you down a wrong road. Thirdly, bad attitudes can drive us down a wrong road. Even when you've heard the voice of God, you can have a bad attitude. Even though God has spoken to you about the course that you should take, we can have an attitude that will hijack the Word of God and take us down a wrong road anyway. That's precisely what happened to Balaam. That's why it's referred to as the way of Balaam, forsaking the right way and going astray. So a person can hear and know the mind of God, but an attitude can hijack that, rationalize going another way. There is something kink in Balaam's heart that pulls him in a wrong direction back to David. He's angry. That is what is driving his course uh, when he's made a decision to kill Nabal uh, and all his male servants that day. He's driven by anger. That anger has put him on a wrong road uh, and it's required that somebody gets in his way uh, and prevents him from continuing. So our own bad attitudes that we need to repent of at this altar Number four, we don't always see the need for correction. Our own pride and stubbornness gets in the way of hearing from God and receiving the correction that we need. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Balaam's headed toward a cliff. He doesn't realize it. He doesn't recognize, even probably now, what he's going to ultimately do and what his fate is going to ultimately be. He's blinded because he doesn't see the need that he has for correction. Fifthly, you may not like the instrument through which correction comes. You may think the instrument of correction is a real jackass. It's a brother or a sister or a sermon or a pastor or a leader or a friend or someone that you consider a subordinate. We may not like, and so because of that, we refuse. Who do you think you are? Who's authorized you to speak to me? Dangerous attitude. Because that might be the instrument through which God is trying to help you. He's not always going to send the Pope to correct you. <laughs> or someone who in your eyes is acceptable. Someone who's been officially deputized for the task. So let me talk about the blessing of receiving correction. We need to see the lesson here that Balaam teaches us. And the lesson that Balaam teaches generally is don't be Balaam. He didn't receive correction. That's why it's referred to, as I said, as the way of Balaam or the error of Balaam. This is what it is. He allowed his heart to drive him in a wrong direction 
even in the face of God's very proactive effort to frustrate first, then pain, crushing his leg against the wall, and then removing options, that proactive effort by God to bring a correction change to his course, it all failed. And all God was ultimately able to do with Balaam is by time. Eventually, a wrong course chosen will take you over a cliff and then you'll be unretrievable. God is trying to prevent that. That's why he goes along with Balaam on this wrong road. That's why the angel of the Lord gets on that wrong road and stands in the way of him making further progress along that wrong road. God did buy a little time. The Bible says Balaam was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained was able to temporarily marginalize his destructive behavior. But because of Balaam's uh, uh, stubborn insistence and refusal to receive correction, he ends up over a cliff in his life. And outside, listen, correction sometimes, if God can't get to you by speaking to your life, if that's not enough to put you on a right course because you're surrendered and you want to obey and you have the sense to get on that, if you don't do that and you choose a wrong road or you get slightly misguided in how you're dealing with things and handling things, then God's only alternative is to begin to marshal resources in an effort to bring correction to your life. That's the only means he has. What else can he do? And of course, eventually, in the case of extreme intransigence, God will eventually take his hands off. No longer will he strive to intervene. And to me, that is the scariest of propositions. God will not always strive with man. So let me close by talking about the blessing of receiving correction. Had Balaam listened, what if he had listened? All right, when God spoke to him and said, don't go with him, he didn't listen to that. Goes down a rope, but what if he would have listened somewhere along the way? After frustration, after pain, after God removing options, what if he had listened? If he had listened, the destructive course and conclusion of his life would have been averted. Remember, he didn't, uh, curse uh, the children of Israel. In that he obeyed God. But he did tell King Balak, uh, take your women, uh, put them in spike heels and mini skirts, uh, send them among the children of Israel, uh, and that'll finish them off. Balaam did that. And then sometime later in a battle, he's killed. And he's forever known as this man who God tried. God made a monumental effort. I think of some of our brethren that have departed. All the words that were spoken to them, all the sermons, all the appeals, all the circumstances that played out in their lives, they could have averted a disaster that they're now, uh, in, that's now encompassing their lives years down the road. We must learn to receive correction. It is the only means of keeping you on a right course. None of us, by ourselves, even with a good relationship with God, on our own, are going to be able to discern always the right course. You're going to need correction. You're going to need instruction. You're going to need advice. You're going to need counsel. You're going to need wisdom that comes not from yourself or even through prayer, but it's going to come from another voice. And it may even be the means of saving your life and your destiny. He who receives correction, Proverbs says, is prudent. The word to receive there makes, means to make something a possession, something of value. 
When correction is offered, you. Can I give you some advice? Humble yourself, listen, and receive it. Notwithstanding that every word of correction may not be exactly on target, but at least have a right heart. In our text, no lines are crossed. This isn't rebellion. No one needed to deputize the donkey. What qualified him to speak and bring correction was that he saw a faithful man of God, at least up until that time, he saw what he didn't see. Pastor, you better have people around you like that. You better not be surrounded by people that only and always tell you what you want to hear. Those are called psychopaths. I mean psychophants. <laughs> Abigail, what gives her the right? This is the future king, man of God, anointed, ordained leader. Abigail brings a word that maybe saved his life. Proverbs again says, take firm hold of correction and do not let her go. Correction can bring a permanent course change that will save your destiny. I've had some of those words of correction. At the time, I didn't like it. At the time, I referred to it the same way Balaam did. Why are you abusing me, Pastor? I'm trying my best. This is, I think, apart from the cross of itself, this is one of the most profound ways that God expresses his love for us. If he didn't care, there'd be no donkey talking to you. He would leave you alone, surrounded by your psychophants who will tell you what you want to hear, for whom the Lord loves, he corrects, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens. We must get past our animus for correction and let God help you. When it comes to our need for correction, don't be Balaam. I want to welcome every one of you to the Department of Corrections this morning. And it is at this altar. I want every head bowed and every eye closed.